Hi, everyone. Imagine you are an alien dropped here onto our planet Earth. All you really know is your own species, your own languages, your own theologies and moralities. And suddenly, you are given the opportunity to look out at something you aren't familiar with. You're seeing new things. The air feels different. The sounds bounce back so quickly between buildings and shadows and this thing they call concrete. And really, with the rolling hills and winding riverbeds, it's quite beautiful. You watch the beings around you, humans, they're called. And you think to yourself naturally, oh, they shake their right upper appendages when meeting for the first time. We don't do that. And again, curiously, almost immediately, I wonder why. You see the humans sitting across from each other as they eat, and you laugh because your people do that too. And the humans put clear liquid on their bodies each day with some kind of surfactant, and you do that too. And the humans press the orifices on their faces together, and, well, you don't do that, actually. But you begin to wonder if there is some form of universal constant. What you don't know is that the things you are wondering and the things you are asking tell us a whole lot about you. We can work really hard on getting the exact answer to a question, especially when that question is really cool, like, is there life beyond Earth? But sometimes, either because we are too focused or too removed, we miss the reason why we're asking that question to begin with. And that reason is important. Sure, we want to know, but why do we want to know? Why do we want to know about other people or planets or stars in the sky? How does any of that help us? If you're sitting there thinking, she sure has a lot of questions for me for someone giving a talk, <laughs> you're right, I do. But so do you, I bet. We are all born with wonder whether it is in wondering why the sky is blue or if the moon really is made of cheese, each and every one of us looks around and wonders. And today, I'd like to introduce you to the idea of how that wondering, that innate curiosity about other things, can help us all understand our pale blue dot a little better. As an autistic woman who has had to navigate a world that, frankly, wasn't really built with me in mind, I know a little something about perpetual wonderment. Much in the same way the alien from earlier looked out at the world around them, I too am enamored and confused by my surroundings. A lot of my life, I really have felt like someone from outer space. And maybe that's one of the reasons I ended up studying extraterrestrial environments. I have always felt a little bit of an outsider trying to understand why some things that come easy to the vast majority of folks at times seem so bizarre to me. But perhaps that is what has made it easier for me to know myself, that I am constantly evaluating the why behind my behavior in order to reconcile my thoughts and feelings with those of the people around me. It becomes a lot harder when I try and figure out why you think the way you do or why anyone thinks the way they do. Why do you flash your headlights at an intersection instead of just following established road laws? Why do you attend events you know you won't like? Why must we begin every email with, I hope this finds you well? <laughs> and a lot of you might tell me, because that's what you're supposed to do. But why? beyond regulation or consequence or complex dynamics, if you've never been told that your way of doing things is different or you've never noticed yourself, then how would you begin questioning the why behind your behavior? If you're never introduced to something new or, shall we say, alien, then how do you know what you're experiencing is universal or personal? How do we know there isn't something more we can learn? I wanted to know why I am the way I am, 
But now that I dedicate my time to searching for life on other worlds, I also find myself wondering why we are the way we are. I have spent all my life observing the collective people, something so much bigger than myself. And the whole time, I thought it was me asking the questions. But it was really the world saying, hey, this is who I am. Who are you? Now imagine that on a planetary scale. If I can look out at the same mountains, the same buildings, the same rivers and rocks, if I can look out at the same human race and learn so much about who I am, imagine what the world can learn about itself looking outward. I believe that is a wildly large opportunity to learn. But given that intangible scale, let's start with something a little more familiar, if not equally large. I won't go into it too much. I'm an astrochemist, not a theologist. But I don't need to be an expert to understand that religion has cosmically impacted how humans see each other and themselves. Over half of surveyed populations believe in something bigger than themselves, have used something bigger than themselves in order to learn how to treat other people, how to love, or how to distinguish friend from foe. People have been using religion to build communities and understand themselves for eons. And so it's not a large jump then for us to understand living by the large and omnipotent religion to the large and incomprehensible space. We can even blend the two. Tens of thousands of years ago, human beings began looking up in their worship, studying celestial bodies as a means to pray. They studied the stars to provide solace in transitioning from life to death or for divine guidance in difficult choices they had to make. At some point, those people looked up and realized we weren't the center of the universe, much to the dismay of nearly everyone. The heliocentric model, that the sun is the center of our solar system, wasn't readily accepted by people. And that makes sense, right? Can you imagine if you, or the generation before you, or before them, had lived your entire lives believing something divine, placed you at the center of the universe because you are special, only to be told by some guy with a questionable haircut that you are, in fact, not? Of course you're going to push back on that. I know I can understand that reaction. After all, my mom told me I was special too. But look at what that revelation gave us. Not only did it provide a more accurate map of physical reality for us to use and build upon, but it also offered us the opportunity, much in a similar way religion alone did to begin with, to know ourselves better. If we aren't the center of it all, then what are we? And we are still using the vast and incomprehensible size of the universe to place ourselves amongst the stars. Famous astronomer Carl Sagan said, the cosmos is within us. We are made of star stuff. We are a way for the universe to know itself. And I am offering an equilibrium of sorts. If the universe can know itself through us, then why can't we know ourselves through the universe? Let us push at the next boundary and see what it shows us. If we can observe the people around us and read religious texts to understand things we've never really thought of before, Surely we can do the same with the final frontier. When we started looking for life beyond Earth, we didn't really know what we would find. Or rather, we didn't want to limit ourselves. We had ideas for what life could look like because we already know what life looks like here. But space is an extreme environment, I hear some of you say. Exactly. But we have extremes here on Earth too, don't we? from the Atacama Desert, which emulates Martian environments, to the Mariana Trench with massive pressure and no sunlight. Humans have always been wrapping their minds around new ways to define life and where it lives. 
finding life in extreme environments was what made us realize, oh, maybe what we've been thinking about life on Earth this whole time isn't even applicable to somewhere else. Because what we thought of life on shorelines or in our backyards wasn't applicable to geysers or trenches either. Maybe life could have evolved differently. So right on our own front step, we are relearning what we once knew. Big things, like what does life need? And we haven't even had to go very far. One of the greatest opportunities we have to search for and learn more about life is right next door, Mars. And why Mars? Well, Mars is comparatively really close to home, both in proximity and likeness. Around 3.5 billion years ago, Mars was a lot closer to what Earth is today. Think liquid oceans, a magnetic field, a thicker atmosphere. Given the similarities between the two planets, we are drawn to the question, could the steps that led to life on Earth have also happened on Mars? And we have spent a lot of time and even more money on that very question. We have sent many missions to Mars. Many of you may have heard of spirit, opportunity, curiosity, perseverance. To space enthusiasts, those words are so much more than just inspiring nouns. Those rovers, as well as their predecessors, encapsulate humanity's attempt at looking out and answering age-old questions on whether or not we're alone. I mentioned that scientists are curious whether life began on Mars as it did on Earth. Well, if it did, what happened to it? Where did it all go amongst the rocky red planet? Could it still be there? And if not, well, what does that mean for the survival of life on Earth? Searching for life on Mars doesn't just tell us about Mars, it can tell us a lot about our own planet too. And so we need to find ways to think of life differently, to think of what we already know differently, to think of extant versus extinct and how life survives. We've been trying to understand extraterrestrial life for over a hundred years. And we have grown our understanding so much since then. Not to mention, space exploration has driven a variety of technologies that we use every day, like a GPS or your cell phone cameras. Imagine what another 100 years could bring about other planets or ourselves or the space in between. But all of this work, all of these questions, all of this wondering and wandering, would finding life beyond Earth really be that significant? Is new technology all we get? What about the search itself is helping you and me? Well, that's just it. It is the wondering. Finding life beyond Earth would be unfathomably cool. But the search for life is about more than simply finding it. The search is about understanding ourselves on a better level than those before us could have only imagined. For me, finding life beyond Earth or evidence of life beyond Earth would mean we aren't alone, or at least that we weren't always alone. Independent emergence of life in our solar system increases the odds that there's life in another solar system. It would mean hope it would mean inspiration. I would no longer be a member of the only planet we know has or has had life. I would be a member of a planet with life. And I can't help but wait in anticipation for what new knowledge that will introduce us to. Searching for life beyond Earth will tell us many scientific things about where we're looking, and the evolution of life itself. But I believe the endeavor offers us more about ourselves. Because searching and learning about the worlds beyond us and learning about the worlds within us are inextricably linked. 
It is the connection of wondering and who we are, the cosmic. And so if you're ever wondering if sending expensive equipment to the stars or messages to the stars is a worthwhile endeavor for humanity when we've already got a lot going on down here, please try and remember how much you learned from the wide world around you. Remember how the alien from earlier was able to ask new questions about itself in the face of the new and unusual. But most importantly, remember that what the Earth has been to you, the universe can be to Earth, sort of. And ask yourself whether or not looking out at the stars, at the planets, at the intangible can tell you something about how to look in. Thank you.